Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining me for my review of season nine, episode two, my insider's perspective and talking about not just what we're seeing in the episode itself, but also some of the background information that it's hard to really know and understand if you're a viewer and not someone who's actually been on the ground participating in alone. So I am going to be talking about something that I alluded to last week, which is talking about things like salt and nutrients and ration choices. I'm gonna be doing that at the end of this video after going through and talking about all of the new folks we've been introduced to and what we were seeing on this season episode two. Last week, I mentioned that I'm gonna be talking about Benji's choice to bring salt. I believe several people on the season brought salt and talking about the salt, sugar, and rice ration versus bringing a block of salt like Benji did versus different ration choices. So I'm gonna be doing that at the end of this after going through and talking about the episode itself and all of the new folks we got to meet this week. So this episode comes in at that crux that's right at the end of the first week and going through all the way to the second week. And so before we dive into talking about what we're seeing on the episode, I think it's really important to talk about what it's like out there during those four, first two weeks, because the first week to two weeks are really critical. It is when our bodies are going through a major shift from being super well fed and having all of the things we need to adjusting to the pretty intense circumstances of being out, even if you're getting food, even if you brought a ration, even if you happen to have great weather and you got a great tarp set up right away, it is still a pretty difficult transition. And that's just physically. It's also a pretty intense mental emotional transition, right? Going from being around people and particularly during this time pre-launch, you are with people all the time, right? You're having three meals a day. You're sitting with all of the other participants. There's all kinds of talking and strategy and camaraderie. You're doing all kinds of stuff with the producers and the show staff. So it's a really intense social time with a lot of pressure to nothing, no human interaction and nothing else going on. So there are all kinds of really intense transitions that we're not necessarily super aware of as the viewer. Every day just kind of looks the same to the viewer, right? But internally, huge difference between week one, week two. And then I would say after that two week time is when it does all start to be a little bit more similar because we've made our hugest transitions mentally, physically, emotionally. So we start off with a whole new cast of characters that we didn't get to meet thoroughly last week. So we begin the episode by looking at Timogen in his spot and him walking around and trying to choose a shelter location. Looking at Timogen, it looks like it is raining as soon as he gets launched, which is an indication that he probably got launched later in the day than a lot of other folks, because some people seem to have quite a window before the rain hits, and it's not that huge a geographic area to where we're gonna be having different weather patterns in different locations. So this is another important thing that a lot of folks don't realize, which is that when you get launched can have a really big impact. Now it looks like we've got different locations and some folks are getting launched with boats and some are getting launched with helicopters. So I'm gonna guess that those different launch styles means that they can be launching people two at a time, right? One out with a boat and one with a helicopter. So hopefully that means that there's not as big a gap, but when you're launching everyone from one helicopter, it can be hours between the first person getting launched and the last person getting launched. And those hours make a huge difference that first day when your for number one priority is to scout around a bit and get that first night shelter up. Doing that with several daylight hours to spare versus doing that when it's already raining and the sun is going down soon, that's a really big difference. So it looks like Timogen is starting off at a bit of a handicap. I'm guessing he was the last one launched just given the fact that others had a while saying, hmm, looks like it might rain. And then there he is standing on the shore in the rain, right? Really excited about getting to bring Timogen on to one of my Q and A sessions on my Patreon channel later in this season. So just a reminder, my Patreon supporters are a huge support in allowing me to do this and they get all kinds of inside scoops that I don't put out to the general public. So please help my channel by subscribing, liking this video, clicking the little notifications bell and consider joining my Patreon team, which is gonna be really awesome this summer. So 
Q&A session with myself and Timogen is gonna be making a guest appearance later. I will say that he has a huge advantage in being a doctor. To my knowledge, this is the first time with someone with that level of medical training and an actual doctor has been on the show. And just as he says, knowing how to treat himself and understand what's going on with his body is huge because how many medical tap outs or other health related issues do we see on the show, right? It tends to be a really big thing. It takes a lot of people out every season. So having someone who not only knows how to recognize what's going on with their body and knows how nervous they should be about certain symptoms and who knows how to treat themselves should they have some kind of accident, that's really huge. That and living in in Montreal, so pretty far north. Well, Quebec City is where some of his footage was. Quebec City is far north. Montreal is not super, super far north as it goes in Canada. But living in a northern climate, being Canadian, having military background with intense deployments and having the medical skills, really, really good skill set. So I'm really excited to see what we're going to see from Timogen out there. Definitely looks like a challenging place he's in with so much deadfall and not a lot of open ground and really hard area to be able to scout. Those woods are just so thick. It's gonna be really hard to cover much ground and be able to see very far and know what kind of terrain you've got to work with. So we see Timogen setting up his first night shelter by just hanging some paracord between trees and setting up a simple A-frame. Simple A-frame is a great way to go, especially for your first night out when you want something quick and effective. Another thing that's really helpful about it is that it's gonna give you a really good pitch to your roof, which is gonna make it way more waterproof. And the majority of your tarp is up, suspended, not on the ground. I don't know if you guys are thinking about this as I am, but as I am looking at those tarps, they are really, really thin. They are one of the thinnest grades of those standard woven poly tarps that it comes in thinner than I've ever seen. They look more like garbage bags than they look like tarps. They are extremely fragile. So being really, really mindful of how you set it up that first night in particular, when there's urgency, you don't have a lot of time and you're doing a rush job that you don't think matters that much, really easy in your haste to drag it past some of that dead ball that's everywhere around there or over a branch with a little stick sticking out of it and to get that big hole in your tarp right off. So the nice thing about Timogen using paracord is it means that he's only suspending it on materials that he knows don't have a bunch of snags and rough spots. We'll talk about this when we look at some of the other shelters that people are putting up as well. So really, really key to be really careful with that shelter that first night. And the paracord isn't ideal because it does sag in the middle, but it's quick and easy and does the minimal damage. I'm honestly a bigger fan of using something like a ridge pole and peeling it well, but that's gonna take a lot longer. So the advantage is that it's gonna be straight, it's not going to sag at all, and it's gonna be allowing you to have a firm structure to pull it from to keep that tarp nice and taut. It's gonna take longer though. If you're planning on doing a shelter that uses a ridge pole, then you've already got your ridge pole, so it's not necessarily lost effort, and that would be my choice in such a situation. But there are so many factors that they have to consider that we don't know as the viewer. From here we go to Terry, and Terry is out there on the river with a harbor seal, which is a really great clue to the kind of terrain they're on. So they're all on a big river, but big rivers are heading out towards the sea. And we saw that last episode with Igor, who had seaweed to eat. Right now we see Terry with a seal. A lot of other folks are clearly further inland. So I'm gonna guess Igor is probably the closest to the ocean because the water must be brackish or close enough for tidal influences to be bringing in seaweed like that. Terry, I'm wondering if Terry is the next one in because it's close enough to the actual ocean for that seal to be coming up, probably getting some of those amazing trout that are clearly in that river, right? So cool to know that you're close enough to the sea that maybe you're going to have some access to salt water. Not cool to have a harbor seal that is potentially going to be competing with you for your fishing. So Terry says absolutely the right thing early on. He says, first thing I want to be focusing on out here is my shelter and then getting fire. So absolutely right in an environment like that. Unfortunately, oh my gosh, what a hard time getting fire. Really feeling for him because in an environment like that, the ground the lichen, the moss, everywhere around you is just absolutely saturated. And we really see this in that shot of that blueberry bush with water dripping from every single weed. So the, the environment is just so moist and damp 
that everything sucks up water like a sponge. And he clearly had a great thought harvesting some dry tinder right off the bat. And then, ah, oh, he left it out of his shelter. And it might not even have rained, but just being outside overnight, there's gonna be a ton of condensation, which you can see from that environment, right? Super low, super boggy, such a hard time getting dry tinder in an environment like that. So one strategy that's really helpful in such an environment is to gather everything super, super fine, like he has, he's got those lichens, really fine, grass or other weeds, vegetation. There's usually fireweed in the far north, that nice light fluff that fireweed makes or the, the open sepals, they're really fibrous. So gathering up all of that really fine stuff and tucking it into your clothing where your body heat is going to keep it dry. There comes a point if you're sweating in your clothing that if it was already dry and you tuck it in there, then it's possible that the condensation inside your clothing is gonna be making it more damp. But if it's truly wet, not just slightly damp, it's gonna be drying it more than it's gonna be getting it wet. So that's a great strategy in environments like that. Another strategy, and it looks like he does end up doing this the following day, is there are a lot of bigger trees around. So some of those fallen logs, particularly if they're not horizontal on the ground, but if they're caught up in a tree, so they're well above that damp ground, those big pieces, likely if you have the tools to get into them, ideally a saw, to cut them and an ax, which is a lot of gear items. A lot of people likely don't have both a saw and an ax, but if you do, then be able to saw those into pieces and then split them and get to the very center where the wood is most likely to be dry and then fine, fine shavings, like literally dust and then little fine slivers like hair and up. Those are gonna be really great tinder and probably the best chance for dry tinder in a place like that. So there's the stuff you can get off the environment that you wanna guard carefully and keep as dry as possible. And then there's more effort, but another way to get dry tinder is splitting a big tree and getting that dry core. We also see Terry doing a technique with a ferro rod that we haven't seen a lot of, which is scraping it with a lot of pressure and really slowly and getting some shavings of the ferro rod down into his tinder bundle before he's actually going with more vigor to get sparks. Now, this is a strategy that a lot of people are gonna be thinking of magnesium rods with, because magnesium is something that will catch if it gets a spark and it's gonna burn really, really hot and it makes it really easy to light other tinder, even if it's a little bit wet because it's pumping out so many BTUs. Ferro rods, they will catch and burn, but they don't catch a spark in the same way as magnesium. So the only way that that's gonna help his fire is if he actually gets flame that then lights that bit of the ferrocerium rod, which is then going to burn really hot hotter than his tinder. And so it makes it easier to catch other things. So it's not a bad strategy, but it's not the same as using a magnesium fire rod in, in conjunction with a fire rod. Oh my gosh, you guys, it is starting to rain, which I have to say it is June in California right now. And what an amazing thing to have it be cool. I'm wearing long sleeves and we're getting a little bit of rain. This is awesome and very appropriate for talking about alone season nine really feeling for Terry with not being able to get a fire that first night. Just such a feeling of defeat. And also he needs it for water. And so not having water is really, really a critical survival crux because you can't go very long without dehydration really affecting your body, affecting the way your mind works and potentially setting you up for a hard time, even if you do eventually get water. Se severe dehydration, can take a while to recover from and it can really muddle your senses in the meantime. So crossing my fingers for Terry to get fire soon. Also that shelter, dang, looking pretty rough. Really think it would have been a better idea to do something to get it raised up, having some support, not just wrapped around them because that makes it one, have a lot more contact with the ground and dragging past snags can get a hole in it. The condensation issue he has also with tarps that thin when you've got all of that, <laughs> that surface area where the tarp doesn't have much pitch and it's gonna have low spots where it's gonna be puddling, I'm guessing that some water is gonna be able to get through a tarp like that. So, oof, hoping that he gets his shelter a little bit more together soon. And then we get to meet Tom. Now, right away I'm thinking, wow, Tom is a pretty slender guy going in doesn't have a lot of reserves on him. So I'm really, really hoping that Tom gets a lot of food because it definitely makes a difference out there. And it looks like a lot of folks have managed to put on a fair amount of weight and I'm not sure that Tom has managed it. So it's gonna mean that he's got food, 
more on the line at the very beginning of his experience than some other folks might. Really loved hearing about Tom's background and seeing that he is someone who tends the land, does prescribed burns in his area, and seems really to be in deep relationship with the ecology of his home space. And I have to say, as someone who believes that that is a super important survival skill, I believe that it's not just the way that we relate to the land, but I also feel that the land recognizes someone who has that kind of relationship and history with having a tending relationship with the land. And I feel that the land appreciates that and responds to it. So hoping that that ends up being a really critical skill for Tom, his dedication to tending and engagement with the ecology of the wild landscape. As we see him walking around, just again, hard terrain, thick, thick woods. It means it's more calories to walk around. It means that we don't get a lot of sunlight down to the ground, which means it stays wet. Everything just stays wet a lot harder. It makes it hard to navigate, way easier to lose your way in thick woods like that. We saw this with Teresa on season eight, losing her way and not knowing how to get back to her shelter late one night. So that kind of thing is way more of an issue in thick, thick woods like that. And then of course, it's just hard to, to get a feel for the resources. It makes it easy to lose your arrows, easy to lose other things, and you just can't see very far in front of you. So harder to see game, harder to know where good water is, harder to scout and just assess your location. So I'm gonna circle back to talking about the type of fletching Tom has on his arrows when we see it with a couple other folks, especially when we see arrows side by side, but Tom is using a particular type of arrow that is really wise to bring to that location. And he gets a squirrel with it, hallelujah. Just have to say, these people have been killing it, literally and figuratively, with their hunting. It is amazing how much success we're seeing with so many people really early in the season. So awesome, awesome indicator that we're gonna see more people well-resourced this time and a little bit less starvation, which is always <laughs> a really nice thing to see in, in a season of alone. Also, huge props to Tom and everybody else. This is the first season that we have not seen the one thing that is one of my biggest pet peeves and biggest poor choices that people made in survival situations like out on alone. And that is Tom is cooking that squirrel in his pot, right? Not skewering it on a stick over the fire and roasting it. The issue with roasting things over the fire are many. One is we tend to overcook the outside and leave the inside raw. You basically can't get the inside fully cooked without overcooking the outside, which means you're more likely to get sick, which we have seen happen with people eating undercooked animals on alone seasons. And then even more important, when you have something dangling over the fire, what is happening? The fat is melting, dripping into your fire, and catching fire, and you are losing the most important resource on that animal, the fat. It melts at high temperatures. Do not roast your animals over an open fire where everything that you need most drops into the fire and gets burned up and goes away. Second thing is also the blood is dripping out. Blood is the highest source of sodium. So there is salt in the blood of animals. And if that blood is dripping out into the fire, again, you're losing one of the most important resources. We see so many people have issues with not enough salt out there. So People cooking in their pots means they're cooking more thoroughly. It means the bones are getting cooked well enough that they're gonna be able to eat the ends of the bones, get some good collagen and some good calcium and other minerals from the bones. And it means that you are not losing the most precious parts. So nice Tom and nice on everyone else who has been cooking in their pots, not over the fire, hallelujah. <laughs> And then we go to Adam, hearing a little bit more about his background. I knew there was someone from England on this season, and I've been waiting to see who it is because there's no English accents on this season. But it is Adam, and it seems like he lost his accent early on so that he didn't get made fun of in Arkansas. And that is the kind of thing that builds resilience. So sometimes having to struggle a bit makes us stronger people. I'm hoping we're going to see that in Adam. He's doing some demos and showing his life. And I will say that he sets up that figure four trap with a deadfall and says that would have been a dead mouse. And it would have been. It also would have been a mouse that was squished to smithereens with its guts spewed all over the rest of its body because that rock was enormous 
for a mouse. So generally speaking with dead balls, you want to be sizing the size of the rock to the critter that you're trying to take out with it. Because if it's too lightweight, then you're not going to kill the creature. But if it's too big, then you're going to be destroying the creature and making it less edible. So something to think about if you're setting up for a loan or actually setting up dead balls in a survival situation. I will also say that sailing a, a big passage on a sailboat going across the Atlantic on your own, that is freaking awesome training for a loan because guess what? You are all by yourself. It is really, really challenging. Less resources in the open ocean, depending, than on land. And there's no tap out button. So I feel like a solo sailing journey is really building resilience for an experience like alone. Really sweet. Adam is killing it again with his shelter. Really nice shelter from the very beginning. I will say it seems a little tall and that's going to be a lot harder to heat, but there's, there's positives and negatives with something like that, right? Because you want it to be a place that feels really good to be in for your mental, emotional outlook, being comfortable, feeling really good about your shelter, knowing that it's solid. That counts for a lot. Being cold also burns up a lot of calories, so you really got to balance that equation. And if you're a tall person and squatting is hard on your body, then sure, maybe having a shelter that you can stand up in a lot of is a good idea. But to me, I would have wanted that a little bit lower so I could still be comfortable, but so it was going to heat up with the heat of my fire a lot more efficiently. That said, heck yeah, uh, that nice moss for the walls and having it be sturdy peeling the poles so that they're not going to damage the tarp. And then him doing the, the shingling with the pine boughs is really awesome because one, sure, it helps shed the water so that you've got a, a fail safe, you know, you've got that to stop the water before it even gets to your tarp, but also it's going to protect the tarp. So branches that fall down aren't automatically going to just pierce your tarp. It's also going to be adding some insulation. So a lot of great things about the way he's putting together that tarp with the moss on the sides and the pine boughs, spruce boughs on the top. That said, you cannot always trust the little alone, <laughs> the little text on the bottom of the screen because it says in there, moss is waterproof and blah, blah, blah. That's ridiculous. Moss is not waterproof. Moss soaks up water like a sponge. That's how it works. It's not a vascular plant with tubes that transport water. The way it does it is by slurping it up and just wicking it to all of <laughs> all of its far-reaching little branchlets. So moss is not waterproof. It's a great insulator, so for sure it's a good call, but take some of those text bars with a grain of salt. <laughs> good example of that. Then we get back to Terry and we see Terry get fire. And I was just so happy for him. If you have never been somewhere cold and wet without drinkable water, without being able to get a fire, you likely don't understand on a deep visceral level what a big deal it is for him to get that fire. And I love the shot of him after he has drunk water, which he has been without for a while. You can just see on his face, the joy and gratitude. Then we get to see Terry starting to work on a more permanent shelter. I hear him, shelter isn't his thing. The food is more his thing. I think he makes a solid choice to make a simple A-frame, which is a super effective shelter. It's very conservative of your calories because it's easy to put up and it does the job. I will say that he doesn't secure the ends and so his, his tarp is not taut and a taut tarp really makes a difference for an a-frame particularly with a crappy tarp like the ones they're being issued think about it canvas tents what makes them waterproof is the fact that they're taut so if you have a plastic tarp with holes in it if you have it taut enough the rain is still probably going to pass over those holes just like it passes through the holes in the weave of a piece of taut canvas but if you've got the walls slack like that then they're not going to be as waterproof and it's gonna be catching water, it's gonna be moving, it's gonna be catching the wind and it's more likely to get torn up by the wind. So a lot of reasons why taut shelter walls are really a more ideal thing. But it's early on in the game, hoping that Terry is gonna figure that out and put a little bit more work to that simple structure and have it be more effective for it. Then we circle back to Timogen and we see him making his fire pit. Now, I don't have much experience with Dakota fire pits, but it makes sense to me that Timogen is the one who we see making them because I think of them as more of a military survival kind of a tactic. 
specifically, they are a way to make fire that is hidden, right? They don't smoke very much. They work like a rocket stove. So they don't make much smoke and you don't see any flames because the flames are beneath the ground. So if you are on a mission and you're trying to be stealthy, then they're a great technique. I don't think that they're as good an idea for somewhere like alone because one, you're not getting all of the light, which is not just useful to be able to do things, but it's also really, really comforting to the soul to be having that, we call it soft fascination, that play of light and color that's just so mesmerizing. That's really, really good for your emotional well being and for your brain health and your nervous system. So, burying your fire like that, you're missing out on that. Also, it's great for cooking because it directs a lot of heat right up under your pot. But if you think about it, you're not getting very much of the warmth because the earth itself is a huge thermal mass. So your fire has to heat up all of that earth before it's sending much heat up to you into your shelter. So thermal mass, like the clay that Juan Pablo put on his stove, that's great because it's gonna be absorbing the heat and then giving it out even after the fire is dead. But when you're talking about a contiguous, enormous thermal mass like the earth itself, there's no way for you to pump out enough BTUs that you're gonna be getting that reflected back to you very much. Most of it is gonna be lost. So I'm curious how that's gonna go for Timogen and whether he's gonna to want to alter his fire setup over the course of it. Again, I don't have much experience with them. That's just, you know, a knowledge of physics and fire and shelter speaking. We'll see. We can also see in the shot of Timogen getting his fire going, that is birch bark that he has to work with. And we're not seeing, as we see people walk around, any birch trees. So it seems that they are scarce in that area or we would be seeing more people use them in their fire making. Huge, huge resource for Timogen to have that birch bark access. You see it light up with one spark there. Having birch bark and a ferro rod together is like having a lighter because birch bark is full of volatile oils that catch easily and burn for a while and make other things catch easily. So they are going to be able to light the wet tinder that you have if you have enough pieces of birch bark under there. Awesome resource. He's very lucky. Then we go back to Tom. Oh my gosh, so impressed with Tom's brilliance in dyeing his hair a variety of bright colors for tying flies. You are really limited with the resources that you have out there, 10 items, and they didn't get to bring flies is my understanding, so they had to make them. What a brilliant thing to be getting creative and using everything you've got. So love, love, love that Tom was smart enough to get that set up for himself before he went out. I used my hair a ton in the Arctic on season six. I used it in my snaring. It was huge because I was working with just paracord and fishing line, not snare wire. So I used my hair to tie open my snare loops because fishing wire is floppy compared to snare wire. So I made it rigid by tying it with my hair. Awesome resource, not a lot of people think to use. So very impressed, Tom. And dang, did it ever pay off look at those beautiful fish. Wow, beautiful string of brook trout. Really, really happy to see Tom get both a squirrel and then those fish in this episode. And then we go back to Jacques and wow, yet again, we see Jacques bringing in wonderful food. That brook trout was gorgeous. And sure enough, it looks to be the biggest one that we saw. Well, Terry's was pretty darn big, but like a good sized brook trout. So thus far, Jacques has been doing awesome with food, the grouse and several squirrels and that trout. And what I really, really appreciate about Jacques is his gratitude and his respect for those animals. So we see Jacques kissing that fish and being really conscious of killing it right away so that it doesn't have to suffer. I love how conscientious Jacques is in thinking about all of this and how much we can really see and feel his gratitude and his appreciation to those creatures. Then we go to Jacques in his shelter and it is looking so good. He has that nice wall of peeled poles so he can lean on it comfortably and those are gonna be reflecting the fire. We see him with lots of tinder, lots of firewood prepared. He's got a nice fire pit with a rock reflector bouncing the heat back at him. Looks like it's really well set up well stocked and he so far seems to be eating better than anyone with grouse and squirrel and trout. So really clear that he has mad wood skills and has got a really nice setup for himself. 
At the same time, it's clear that Jacques is struggling mentally more than anyone else out there. He looks the most comfortable and the best fed, but he's having a hard time. And it really shows how important the mental game is. And we are going to circle back to this towards the end of the episode. Back to Adam at his shelter, and we see those windows he has put in with a clear tarp. Now, a lot of people are wondering how he has more tarps than anyone else. He brought a tarp as his gear item. Everyone gets issued one tarp, and then you have the option to bring another. And this is something that a lot of people who have built boats have planned for in advance. Looks like Adam planned for in advance in terms of making windows so he has natural light in his shelter, which is a sweet strategy. It's also a really big sacrifice to have a whole gear item just for that. And we've seen other people address that in different ways, like um, Kylan on season seven, bringing her gaiters as a material that she could use for windows. So that way she didn't have to give up a whole gear item. So we'll see whether or not it ends up being a worthwhile sacrifice for Adam to use a whole gear item for that. But it's also awesome that he has those grommets to make the eyelets for his fly rod. So really creative use of all of the resources in a tarp, not just the uses that are the most obvious ones. And then we see him out there with the grouse, really struggling with whether or not he should shoot it. He shoots it once, he loses the arrow. Losing an arrow is a big deal out there. And I talked about this on the first episode. We didn't see anyone lose an arrow, but I said, oh my gosh, look at that terrain. This is an area where you have to be really, really conscientious and make good choices about whether or not to take shots because losing an arrow is a major handicap. So he loses one and then he's there looking, do I take another shot or not? Do I wanna sacrifice two arrows to get this grouse? So he does take another shot. And this is an interesting point too, because we can see that the arrow that he is knocking there is a broadhead, not ideal for a grouse, but it's probably what he had. I get it. <laughs> the arrow that I shot my grouse with on season six was also a broadhead and it went right through that grouse and the grouse took off and it took a while for me to find it. And I really wasn't sure if I was going to. So it's, you gotta, you gotta take the shot if you think it's a good shot. It's huge to get that game, but a blunt is what's gonna be so much better. And you see the other folks who've gotten grouse this far, they use blunts and it stuns the animal and knocks it down and they're less likely to take off or it actually stays in the animal. And so it's gonna be bringing them to the ground right away rather than just injuring them, but passing through so they fly off. That said, he didn't get the grouse, it flew off. So he lost the grouse and two arrows and losing a broadhead is an even bigger handicap because big game would be huge. And Adam is dreaming about that bear and bear meat and I'm so with him. I thought about bear meat every day on season six, but losing a broadhead, that's gonna hurt your big game potential, not just your small game potential. So it's a much bigger hit to lose the potential at big game than one squirrel or grouse or what have you. And we are gonna be talking about bear and what a resource bear is in another review. So much to talk about in these, it's hard to get everything in. <laughs> Also, we see the fletching on the arrow that Adam is using is called flu-flu fletching. And we wanna talk a little bit about the difference between flu-flu arrows and standard arrows. We see some of his arrows have standard narrow fletching. So these are gonna be for longer range shots. They are going to give the arrow a lot more speed because they're gonna have less drag and resistance. The beauty of the flu-flu arrows is they are designed for short range. They are big, long, kind of shaggy fletching. And what that means is they have a lot of surface area, they're gonna catch a lot of air, and they're gonna slow down that arrow. So if you're shooting at something that is relatively close to you, that's perfect because it's not far enough for that drag to significantly slow the arrow and mean you don't get that shot but it means that if you don't get that shot, your arrow doesn't go flying another 50 yards where it's hard to find, right? It's more likely to hit the thing and then drop and you're going to find it. So flu flu fletching, brilliant idea out there. I wish I had thought of it, frankly, on season six, lost arrows was a big deal and mostly I wasn't taking huge long range shots. I like that Adam has a combination of some flu flu arrows and some standard fletching really, really good way to play it. Then we come back to Jacques and Jacques is standing there 
pulling up his shirt, looking at how much weight he has lost. And even though he seems better fed than most folks, he's dropping weight like crazy. And I think that this is one of the factors that's actually really weighing on him in his later decision-making process. It's really easy to feel defeated, especially when you feel like you're doing well. And he said before, I feel like I'm killing it out here. But then you look at that weight loss and then you question everything, right? And then you think, oh God, maybe I'm not killing it. Maybe I'm not doing as well as I thought. Maybe there's other people out here getting big game and I'm just getting small fish and small game. And so I'm guessing that that was part of the kind of snowballing of all of those different mental emotional processes that Jacques is really starting to feel big time here. This just shows that alone is about the physical skills, but it is such a mental emotional thing, right? Jacques, he has a great location. He seems to have both deep forest and a lot of resources and open area, less dense and thick than with the areas we're seeing a lot of people really struggle with. He's eating well, he's got a great shelter, and yet he's having the hardest time. Having that good strategy for how to bring yourself back when you're having a really hard struggle out there is a really important strategy if you wanna be out there long-term. So this brings up the question, what is the goal here? Not everybody has the same long-term goal out there. Some people are there for the experience. Some people, the only thing they care about is winning. Some people aren't sure why they're out there, but they wanna see what this amazing initiatory journey has to teach them. And so I think we're really seeing Jacques in that process of weighing, what is this about? What do I care about? What are my goals here? And how am I doing with all of those? Clearly the loneliness, the hunger, the isolation, and the, the mental aspects of what it is to take a life are really weighing on him. Back to Adam, getting so many fish. That was a really, really sweet venture. Those islets from his tarp are working awesome. And he's eaten a really good meal. And I think he did a great call of eating all of the small fish, which were significant, and smoking that large fish. It's a lot easier to put up the larger animals than it is all of the tiny fish. So the eating your fill rather than really rationing, he could have just eaten one fish and saved them for a long time. Then he would be getting weaker and then he would be less able to go out and get more fish. So I think eating a lot right then rather than rationing was a really good strategy. So good on you, Adam. Great call and it's awesome to get to see you eating so well. Also love what Adam shared at the end there. Just every day out here is a gift. And that is so important because if all it's about to you out there is winning, your chances of doing that you'd think would be 10%, but that's if everything is equal. And it's clearly not. Some locations are harder, some have more resources. So your chances of winning are not very large, but if every day is a gift and you can appreciate that, then you can be out there winning every day. And every moment that you get to spend out there in that amazing place is a win. So love Adam's attitude and it's exactly what kept me so long in the Arctic, just appreciating everything that I had rather than focusing on what I didn't have out there. And then finally, we come back to seeing Jacques sitting with a really big question. And I know there is a lot of critique of the folks on Alone and a lot of people who say, oh, he wasted his chance and they shouldn't have put someone on if they were just gonna give up that soon. But again, the question really is, what is the goal here? And we have no idea from the outside what is going on internally for someone. For someone who is processing deep trauma in their life and then comes to a place of healing, what bigger win could there possibly be than that, right? So, you know, on the one hand, we can say, well, maybe that was just a hard time and he could have pushed past it and, and found something even better. But maybe that was the most potent moment and the choice he made in that moment of deciding what was really important to him and honoring and going for that. Maybe that was more transformative to him than the win or a bunch of money, right? I loved what he said as he was leaving, which is, this is the first time in my life that I feel like I have everything that I want and I am running to something rather than running away. And <laughs> I'm gonna get emotional right now, but that really got me and that, that hit me deep inside and I really felt it. And I feel so happy for Jacques to have come to that place of, of healing and joy for himself. And that's what alone is really all about. 
We don't know what the journey is that we're signing up for in that moment. It is something that unfolds for us while we're out there. And pretty much it's always gonna be something different than we expected. And what a beautiful thing to go out in that way rather than being pulled for weight or from an injury or who knows what could have befallen him. And I don't know if the rest of you noticed this, but in some of those special bonus scenes they put at the end, we saw a little piece of brass wire wrapped around Jock's finger. And it seemed to me that that was a pretty strong statement of a commitment <laughs> that he was making to his life back home and his sweetheart. And Jock and I are connected through Facebook from alone. And his profile these days says engaged to rather than in a relationship with Catherine. So I think that that was a pretty huge thing for him out there and a really beautiful thing that he came to. So congratulations, Jock and Catherine, and that touch of that that ring on your finger that looked a little bit subtle, but I certainly picked it out, it really hit me. So I promised I would circle back around to talking about salt and nutrients and some of these more physical chemical factors that we're thinking about in terms of alone. And I wanna put out there that I am going to be talking about this more in depth in some of the Q and A live Zoom calls I'll be doing with my Patreon members. So check out my Patreon membership and consider joining me. And I'll probably be hitting on these things in more of these videos too. So if you subscribe and hit the notifications, you're gonna be getting notice of when I put out these videos. So Benji's choice to bring salt. We have seen a lot of people have massive issues out there from lack of salt. It can be potentially a really dangerous thing to have your electrolyte balance thrown off significantly. We saw Larry on season five. I don't know if it happened to him on season two, but lacking out from lack of salt, from mineral imbalance out there. While it seems like a big sacrifice to have a whole gear item be something like salt, there's certainly the potential that it could give you weeks out there or that it could save your life because if you blacked out and hit your head on a rock and weren't awake to hit the, hit the call button, lack of salt could potentially kill you. So I get why Benji chose that. It's not a choice that I feel like I would have made because I think that there are some other ways to be creative about getting your salt needs met. You could bring a ration that you highly, highly salted. Nathan on season six, my season, did that same thing. He brought Gorp and he soaked all of his raisins in a really, really intense salt brine. So each raisin was like a salt tablet, but then he also had the chocolate and the peanuts. So he had a lot of calories in addition to the salt. That said, bringing a salt block like Benji did also gives you the potential to put that out for game and draw game in. I believe that they don't have deer up there and that they didn't have the capacity to take deer, but a lot of animals are drawn to salt. And so bear could come to a salt lake. So it's possible that that salt could get you big game. That said, there's another item, a food choice, as opposed to the salt block, which is a hunting choice that also comes with salt. And that is the salt, sugar, and rice ration. However, I consider sugar and rice to be fairly useless out there because they are carbohydrates. And if you're eating carbohydrates, then you are delaying your body's metabolic transition into ketosis. And ketosis is a more efficient metabolic state to be in. So you don't wanna delay ketosis. So I think that bringing the salt block is probably a better idea than the sugar, salt, rice ration. Also in that ration, it's probably just white salt. Benji bringing the Himalayan pink salt is brilliant because there's a lot of other minerals and minerals are really, really important when you're out there. Vitamins are really important out there. So what I would have done rather than just bring the Himalayan salt was bring like a livestock salt block that has a bunch of vitamins in it or make your own. Pound up multivitamins, B vitamins are super, super important. Calcium and iron, potassium is super important. Vico had major issues from lack of potassium on season eight. So making a salt block that has the vitamins and minerals that your body needs would be an awesome strategy. So that's what I would have done. That said, it's possible that that wouldn't have been allowed, but if you made it like one of those livestock blocks, I think that they would allow that. So a salt, vitamins, and mineral block, pretty smart way to go. Personally, what I did is I was really conscious of health and nutrition before going out so I loaded up my system by eating really healthy, lots of liver, lots of food-based multivitamins, lots of dried green supplements, vitamin mineral greens, 
all kinds of things have my body as fortified with all of the minerals and vitamins that it needed that could be stored in my system. So things like vitamin C, they leave your system right away. So you can't do with that. But the longer term fat soluble ones, vitamin D, vitamin A, those ones you can load up your system with. And it's a good idea to be bringing your vitamins out there in that way if you're not gonna be bringing something like a ration that has salt in it or some other way to get those needs met out there. Thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate you watching and look forward to seeing you on my season, season nine, episode three recap.